Hey guys, we are back here for our fourth installment of our discussion on the plague. This one is going to cover book two, sections two, three, and four, uh, and will get us, you know, significantly into the first half of the book. Uh, we're going to still see a little bit of internal development of the town in general, but we're also going to see, uh, you know, one of the big iconic scenes in this, which is Father Panaloo's week of prayer speech, um, <clears throat> and gets a few minor discussions from section four. I don't have as much there. Uh, this should be a relatively quick video, to be honest with you, as long as I don't get all on too many side tangents. Section two is really the meat of this, so let's start with it. I apologize for drinking coffee. My voice is going bye-bye after a whole week of talking pretty much bell to bell and now doing all these videos. So um, we start section two with, you know, a very, it's easy to pass over scene, but we see these people putting sentries at the town. And that indicates, okay, now it's real because this is, you know, for example, here in Mobile, we have a mask mandate right now, but I'll let you know a little secret. Police aren't enforcing it. And the governor said they probably weren't going to. And I've talked with several police officers who have told me that when they get phone calls about masks, they don't even acknowledge it or come to, to, to deal with it, and which is understandable. The police in Mobile have other issues that they have to deal with, considering we do have other problems. But that being said, just the notion that there's this rule is what causes so much heartburn with people. And imagine what it would be like if there were armed guards posted the entry to each store. I do know a lot of stores have post posted someone out there who's kind of in charge of making sure you have masks. But, I mean, imagine if it was actual police officers or, or heaven forbid, the Army. It definitely changes the way a town feels. So what has happened now in, in town, and if you'll turn to page 78 if you have my book, it says that uh, most people were chiefly aware of what ruffled the normal tenor of their lives or affected their interests. They were worried about and irritated, but these are not feelings with which to confront the plague. So think about that. Worry and irritation are not going to fix a problem. They're just going to aggravate it. it says they were, uh, but these are not feelings with which to confront the plague. Their first reaction, for instance, was to abuse the authorities. The prefects repulsed to criticisms echoed by the press. Could not the regulations be modified and made less stringent? So the immediate response of these people once they start seeing these uh, processes go into effect is to attack the authorities. And once again, wow, don't isn't that exactly what happened here? You know, the immediate thing is to, you know, attack your local or federal authorities and they're what they've done because heaven forbid, you know, we know so much more with our limited information. But yet that's how we reacted. And that's not going to fix the plague or for them or fix a pandemic for us. Yet that seems to be where we go again. And I know I keep pointing to the whole AK-47s on the Capitol steps, people, but that's what we're dealing with. You know, I'm irritated because my life has been interrupted. So this is gonna, my response is not one of sanity. It's one of insanity to go to that level. Um he points out that initially the town, now not the people, the people don't feel this way, but the town, if you were a, an observer and didn't know what's going on, it almost looks like people were on a holiday. You know, they're all kind of hanging out in the streets. They're going to the movies. They're hanging out in cafes. They're not really working, uh, although some are, but it seems like there's more and more out in the streets. Now, that is definitely a difference from what we dealt with because, you know, ours was more about isolating individually. Theirs was more about isolating as a group. But... I do remember those first few weeks of March and beginning into April where people did treat it like it was a holiday. Um, and this is not judging any of you. I don't have social media, so I don't know who did what. I just know for a fact a lot of our families and students, you know, they got that uh, sent home for the what we thought was initially going to be two weeks, and they all went to the beach. Uh, you know, it was, it was, yay, it's a break from school. We got spring break early, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's the way a lot of people approached it, and we see that in this town as well. But that's the way it comes off. It's not what's really going on. Um, we get some more indirect char characterization of Katard. Katard is characterized in a way that he's not really a bad guy, but he comes off really kind of – he makes you cringe. He's slimy in some way. Uh, he talks about there being no money really in a plague, which who thinks about that? Uh, and then he also – he's very flippant about if it keeps going on, everyone's going to be crazy. And he just – I think Ryu actually says that, but – Qatar kind of is the one who inspires that and jokes around about ev the, the, everyone being a, a madhouse. So really um, just a little more about him uh, that was really uncomfortable. Then we get another kind of extensive passage about character development in one of our characters, and that being Grant again. And we're going to learn about his marriage. And this, guys, is – one of the like themes of this book that gets missed a lot. And it's really about, you know, initially we talked about the way you learn about a town is how people die, how they work and how they love. Well, this is going to deal with love 
And Camus seems to have a very negative opinion of the concept of modern love, how we see things. Uh, even the way he describes Gron and his wife getting together is interesting. It sounds semi-romantic, but then it's not. So let's see, it's on page 82. And it describes them like, you know, initially they're, they're, uh, they're, uh, early dating stages is, you know, kind of, it's, he calls it in her, his courting days, he used to go to see her in her home and the family were inclined to make fun of her bashful, silent admirer. Her father was a railroadman. When off duty, he spent most of the time seated in a corner beside the window, gazing meditatively at the passersby, his enormous hands splayed out on his thighs. Uh, skipping a little bit, uh, Gron was nervous to see her crossing a street. The vehicles bearing down on her looked so gigantic. Then one day, shortly before Christmas, they went out for a short walk together and stopped to admire a gaily decorated shop window. After gazing ecstatically at it for some moments, Jean turned to him and said, oh, isn't it lovely? And he squeezed her wrist. Now, that part is somewhat romantic. It's this image of this cute little couple, uh, you know, slowly falling in love. But look, listen to this next sentence. It was thus that the marriage had come about. What? <laughs> we well, skipped some stuff there. He goes from, you know, they're they're looking at uh, a shop window and he squeezes her wrist to, and then they got married. Uh, just kind of a weird setting. And then we get a lot about their ideas on marriage in this. It says the rest of the story to Gron's thinking was very simple. The common lot of married couples. You get married, you go on loving a bit longer, you work. And you work so hard that it makes you forget to love. Ouch. Now, there's a definite negative feel. The idea that, you know, we get caught up with real life and we forget to love the people that we initially fell in love with. It's not challenging that that initial love was fake, but it's that we lose it because we get so focused on our own stuff. And again, I can't say he's wrong in that, you know, that's really the way a lot of people's love lives come off. It's why divorce is such at a high rate now because people, and I'm putting it in quotation marks, fall out of love. It's because they forgot. To, it, it, it's a process. You don't just fall in love on that that, that love at first sight uh, fairy tale stuff, and then it, it, you continue to hold that feeling forever. There's some work that has to be done, um, and he points out that people just forget to do so. Then we find out as it goes a little farther. Look at what happens. I mean, this is all in one paragraph, by the way. We go from them getting married, which is the end of the last paragraph, and then life takes over. Says an overworked husband, poverty, the gradual loss of hope and a better future, silent evenings at home. What chance had any passion of surviving such conditions? And again, they're describing a decaying relationship like we see consistently, you know, even in our world today. I mean, as a married person, I read that. And I'm like, man, I've got to be careful that I don't end up like this. And then look at how they break up. What a just like bleh moment. This is a letter or, or I think it's. Yeah, she left him. I think this is through a letter. Um, she says, I was very fond of you, but now I'm so tired. I'm not happy to go, but one needn't be happy to make another start. And that was pretty much her letter of leaving him was like, hey, you know, I loved you once. I just don't now. And it's time for a new start. And she bails out. Again, something that we could see played out in front of us daily here in this country, too. We're going to come back to this concept of love throughout this book and how, you know, a lot of times people just don't really understand that concept. OK, and while it's not a major theme in the plague, it doesn't mean it's not worth discussing. OK, um, we then transition to another character who has a, uh, a love interest, and that's Ron Bear, who is visiting from Paris, if you'll remember. And his girlfriend is back in Paris. And right now, as this plague gets going, all he can think about is getting back to her. And this uh, degenerates into a, a pretty heated discussion between him and Dr. Ryu about the private wants versus the public good. And that's the remainder of this uh, section. And again, I'll, I'll shorten up, but I want to read a couple of passages and then we're going to you know, bail out and you just need to make sure you read it on your own. Um, Ron Baer says, the truth is I wasn't brought into this world to write newspaper articles, but it's quite likely I was brought into this world to live with a woman. So he's pointing out, you know, I wasn't here for my job. I'm here for this relationship, which is a really romantic idea that, you know, you've been put here for this, you know, relationship with this person and that you're going to have children and you've been put here to raise them and then continue in this cycle, which and I don't really want to challenge that idea. But we're going to find out later that Ron Bear realizes that more, there's more to life than just that. Um, and it's going to change. But Ron Bear is going to go out of his way to try to get out of town. Uh, He's going to seek initially legal means, but later in the book, he will start looking into illegal ones when the legal ones fail him, and he's not able to escape. Um, he points out, 86, 
He says, uh, I don't belong here. And Ryu says, unfortunately, from now on, you will belong here like everybody else. And then carrying over the top, and there's a cuss word here. I'll just believe it myself. He says, but it, doctor, can't you see it's a matter of common human feeling? Or don't you realize what this sort of separation means to people who are fond of each other? Uh, then it's continuing on a little further. Ron Bear says, you can't understand. You're using the language of reason, not of the heart. You live in a world of abstractions. So you can see Ron Bear getting upset because Ryu's not telling him what he wants to hear. Ryu's like, I'm sorry, man. It's a bad luck, but that's where you are. Now, I want you guys to know we had got a detail earlier. And when you're dealing with exposition, where you position details matters greatly. We learned earlier that Dr. Ryu is married and his wife is also out of town. So, you know, we have his wife is gone and he can't communicate with her any more than Ron Bear can con communicate with his. So we know, and this is a little bit of dramatic irony, we know that Ryu does know exactly where Ron Bear is coming from. But, you know, Ryu's not the kind of guy who throws that in someone's face. Um, he makes uh, Ron Bear makes a comment that public welfare is merely the sum total of the private welfares of each of us, which is a really interesting and debatable statement. But it definitely he says, you know. Public welfare is just what's good for each of us individually. Now, you can easily pick, pick up that apart and poke holes in it, but he's pointing out that we can't just ignore our individual feelings and uh, desires because that's what all of those together contribute to what's good for the town. Uh, so they're going to continue to argue over this concept, and this is a this is an argument that comes up consistently in not just literature but in life. What's more important, individuals or the public good? And you can argue either way. None of it, it seems like you should want to say the public good, but Ron Bear shows us that that's kind of a problem because then you're the public good is just a mixture of private good. So um, it's not an easily answered question. And then this ends with I think is the most important part of chapter two or of section two, by the way, is the ending here. And it's this discussion about pity, all right? And this one I will probably have a little bit more to say about in class, all right? Uh, you know, Ron Bear is saying that Ryu has no pity for him, and it says – and this is the top of 90. He says, of course he had pity, but what purpose could it serve? He had to telephone, and soon the ambulance could be seen clanging down the street. I'm sorry. This is not about Ron Bear. This was about a person – who one of their family members appeared to be sick, and uh, Ryu has to contact the authorities, and once he does, that person will be taken away. They're more than likely going to die, and you don't, as a loved one, you don't get to see them again. It's a lot like with coronavirus. When you go into the hospital, you're on your own, and you don't get to interact with your loved ones very much. We, I don't know if you saw, there was tons of these really sad stories about people who were, you know, about to go on the ventilator or who had come off and were just, they knew they were about to pass. And, you know, like one of the nurses would let them FaceTime with their family members. I mean, such a tear jerking uh, stories to have to hear. So that's what these people didn't want. They're like, please show some pity. Don't take him away. Let him stay here. He can die at home. And if I get it, I'll die too. But uh, Ryu says, you know, I have pity. I just don't see a purpose in it. Going over to 91, he says, Ryu had learned that he no longer, I'm sorry, he need no longer steel himself against pity. One grows out of pity when it's useless. And in this feeling that his heart had slowly closed in on itself, the doctor found solace, his only solace for the almost unendurable burden of his days. It's easy to point to people as having no sympathy or no pity, but for a person like a doctor like Ryu, it's a necessity. Because if he feels sad and try, and, and it's the same thing for like police officers, you know they have to learn that everybody's got a sad story, and if you constantly are giving in because of it, then you you can't do your job. And Ryu knows his job is to slow this plague, and he has to therefore abandon pity, which is sad. It's terrible that we have to do that as human beings. But then there's a whole other debate about whether pity is even a useful emotion, which that we'll probably talk about some in class. I think your bell ringer may have actually talked about it. All right, next we go into section three. This is a famous passage. This is the week of prayer passage, and it's Father Panelo's speech. Um, first thing we do is we see the religious uh, tenor of these people, how they actually feel about their faith. And what we get is that they think it can't hurt to go to church, but they really don't buy it. Uh, I would say that's a very modern belief. A lot of people go to church and don't really, they do it because it's what you do on Sundays. And if you don't, then some of your family and friends will judge you for it. And that's really sad that it's become that. But again, it's been that way for a while since this book was written in 1940. Um, so we see these people all show up and Father Panelu delivers his sermon. I'm going to hit the high points of his sermon using some of his very words, okay? He points out that this calamity has come upon these people and they, they deserve it, which is a rough statement. But he's telling them right away, yes, this happened because God is punishing you. 
He says, the plague is used by God to punish the unfaithful. He says the plague is used to separate the wheat from the chaff as well as point us in a direction of what we should be doing, which is being good to our neighbor and doing good deeds. And this now is very clearly, this is how you're going to do it. In a day-to-day -day regular existence, maybe we can forget those things and, and ignore that. But in a, in a plague setting, that's not an option. He says it should promote thought and repentance and should, again, show you where you need to go and what you need to do. Now, I want to be honest with you. I'm not so sure, based on some of the, what happens at the end of this, that Father Panelou is really totally in agreement with what he preaches. Because listen to this. It says, um, I think this is him. Give me two seconds. Uh, yeah. It says, he hoped against hope that despite all the horrors of these dark days, despite the groans of men and women in agony, our fellow citizens would offer up to heaven that one prayer, which is truly Christian, a prayer of love, and God would see to the rest. It feels like to me, and this is where tone comes in, where you have to be an analyst, not just a reader. It feels to me like Father Panelou delivered this speech, maybe not so much buying into the fact that it's punishment, but hoping that people would see it and they would pray for each other and that God would notice and would take their part. It feels like he's gaming this situation. He's trying to get people to feel a certain way so that God will take pity on them. Um, because as we find out later, once Father Panelou is really subjected to seeing this plague firsthand, um, he doesn't necessarily change his opinion, but he changes his wording. Okay, So that is a very shortened up version of Section 3, but that's the main points of it. And then we get to a, note, a section that I have very little notes on, Section 4. It's just kind of the aftermath of the sermon. The sermon has, doesn't have the effect that he had hoped. Instead, people get angry. They feel like they're being punished unfairly. This, and this is a natural response to that type of sermon. It's for people to feel like, well, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And they get angry um, because now it's not so much that this plague is just a biological thing that happens and we have to band together and get through it. Now it's become uh, punishment and imprisonment and people react to that differently. And we're going to see it then react violently eventually. We also see Gron. This, this section really is about Gron and his writing. Um, he points out he's in high spirits, and Dr. Ryu notices it, and it's because he said, I have my work, which, again, this is how we avoid times like right now. And this is why I do feel sympathy for the people who, now some of the people who took place in some of these protests against closing down uh, businesses. If you own a business and this is your not only your way of making money, but the way of keeping yourself sane in times like this, I understand where you're coming from. If you were marching on the Capitol because you wanted to get a haircut, you're a sorry human being. But if you're doing it because you're losing money and, you know, you're in danger of losing your house or, you know, being homeless. And also because there's just something about what we're meant to work and we need that to keep our minds off of things. Otherwise, you sit at home and you watch Fox News constantly and think the world's going to end. So we need to have some distraction and work is a good way to do that. So I feel sympathy for those people. So Gron says, I have my work and that's keeping me And his work. We find out he doesn't mean his clerk job. He means a book he's writing. And then we get what I already told you about him. He is so worried about his wording being perfect that he never gets going. And guys, what is the why does Camus include this? Well, my theory is that he's pointing out how a lot of us live our lives. We, we want everything to be perfect, and we don't want to take a step unless we know it's the right choice. Like, think about some of you right now picking colleges. You're so worried about whether you're going to pick the right college. Like, there's 400 college choices, let's say. I mean, there's, there's more, I'm sure, but let's just use that number. And there's only one that's the right choice. And if you pick any of the other 399, your life's going to go to pieces. That's not true. All right. But we're so worried about making the perfect steps that we make no steps. And then we end up in a very uh, boring, humdrum and depressed situation. So uh, Gron is doing that with his writing. And we're going to see that actually towards the end of the book where he almost dies and what happens with his book at that point. But guys, that right there is under 20 minutes. So we did it. Um, that was my goal. Um, I'm going to end this. This will get us through Thursday and put us up to Friday. And I'm going to try to knock out Friday's videos right next, uh, next, right next, right away. So anyway, thank you guys again for your time. I appreciate your dedication to getting through this uh, very difficult book. And I hope that this is going to be a way to help you with that so that when we do test on this, that you're going to do well. And I have faith in each of you. So um, have a great afternoon or evening, and I will see you back here again re relatively soon for the next uh, installment of this.